Listen to this excerpt from the back cover of Tom Doyle's book entitled Dreams and Visions. Dreams and Visions, published by Thomas Nelson in 2012. Dreams and Visions. It says this in the back. Pastor Tom Doyle has spent 11 years as a full-time missionary in the Middle East and Central Asia, spreading the word of Jesus Christ. Throughout his journey, he has encountered a staggering number of Muslims who were first introduced to Jesus through a vision or dream so powerful, they eventually turned from their lifelong religion of Islam and embraced Christ as their Savior. Despite living in a culture where converting to Christianity can result in execution, these former Muslims have found the hope, peace, and inspiration that comes from knowing Christ. Maybe you've heard that before. Maybe you've heard about these visions of Jesus in the Muslim world. I I can't necessarily speak to the validity of these visions, But as Doyle documents in this book, the result of these alleged encounters is undeniable. It is lives transformed. But there are visions of Jesus that we can be sure about, absolutely sure about. And those visions are found in the book of the Revelation very end of your Bible. You're probably there already. If you're not, turn to chapter 19. The closing book of the canon of Scripture, Revelation. This is our conclusion this morning to this amazing book, and we are concluding our year-long study through the New Testament. So listen to the account preserved by John for us. We're looking specifically at verses 9 and 10 of chapter 19. And this is what John tells us. And the angel said to me, this was one of the angels who had poured out the bowl judgments beginning back in chapter 16. One of those angels said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, very quickly, let me just provide for you a simple three-part breakdown of this (laughs) short passage. It's important to remind you that this passage is the final part of a heavenly revelation that began in chapter 17, verse 1. That's where this begins. And as 17.1 indicates, this heavenly revelation is... Not surprisingly, based on what we've seen in the book already, it's conveyed through a heavenly messenger. The Greek word for messenger is angelos. Angelos. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? That's where we get our English word angel. So anytime you read angel in the New Testament, you could just insert the word messenger there. Although we know that that messenger word is used in a technical sense, right? to refer to a heavenly messenger sent by God. That's why we, in our language, use the word angel because that gives it that technical, very specific sense. That's what we have here, an angel from God. Notice, first of all, in verse 9, there is in verse 9 a confirmation. Take a look on the screen here. A confirmation of the revelation. There's a confirmation of the revelation. The vision of the prostitute's misery that began in chapter 17 has given way to a vision of the bride's marriage, specifically the marriage supper. Even more specifically, we have at least the announcement of her imminent wedding. 
So the shift is from one woman to the other. It's from the harlot, the prostitute, Babylon, over to the bride. Notice that this event is not called, though, the marriage supper of the bride, is it? No, it's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that's really important. The angel confirms the authority and the trustworthiness of this revelation, doesn't he? At the end of verse 9, do you see that? He says, these are the true words of God. Just in case anybody had any doubt about it, these are the true words of God. But in verse 10, we go on to read about some, number two, confusion. Some confusion regarding the revel- concerning the revelation. It appears that these revelations about the harlot's judgment and the bride's joy are so overwhelming to John. They are so transcendent. He is moved to worship the heavenly being who delivered the message rather than the heavenly being who sent the message. Unfortunately, the same thing, this kind of misdirected worship, (laughs) will happen again. John didn't learn his lesson the first time. It took him a couple times here. It happens again a few chapters from now in chapter 22, verse 8. We see John making this same mistake. But thankfully, we also find here in our main passage, in the middle of verse 10, a correction regarding the revelation. A correction regarding this revelation. The angel is quick to set things straight, isn't he? See that? You must not do that. Right? You can just think, what the angels, uh, what are you doing? Notice there are two parts. Both, and notice both parts of the correction here given by the angel. The second part is exactly what we'd expect. Don't worship me. Worship God. Worship God. But look at how that correction is introduced. Why? Why would you worship me? I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters, those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Now think about that. Brothers and sisters, we are fellow servants with angels. Ever thought about that? You are a fellow servant along with the angels of heaven. They stand shoulder to shoulder with us. We serve the same blessed God. We are fellow servants with angels. How is that possible? Because we hold to the testimony of Jesus. Like the angel points out here. And this is where John, obviously writing later, coming back, compiling after De, you know, like decompressing after having this incredible vision experience, coming back, sitting down, writing things down, trying to process this. I think he's reflecting on this strange episode and he adds this final comment there at the end of verse 10. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, whenever I hear that phrase, I immediately think of an exchange that I had with a dear sister in Christ probably 25 years ago at a vacation Bible school at Camelback Bible Church in Perez Valley. 25 years ago, I distinctly remember standing in the church kitchen as swarms of ladies are busy preparing snacks for 200 kids. You know, I'm standing in the corner talking to this woman. I don't remember how the conversation started. I don't remember exactly what I was saying, what I said to her, but her response to me with such sincerity and conviction was this phrase, well, remember, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, in all honesty... I had no idea what she was talking about. I had no no idea what she was talking about. The phrase sounded familiar to me, right? I knew that it was in the Bible somewhere. 
I had no idea what she was talking about. And it sounded so cryptic. It sounded like one of those weird things that certain people will say that I assumed that she was just somehow taking it out of context. Inwardly, I was chalking it up to like this token phrase. This sister had learned somewhere, and every once in a while she would use it when it seemed to fit the situation. But the truth was this. I was the one who didn't understand what was being said. I was the one who didn't understand the statement, and I was arrogantly assuming that she didn't either. Now, looking back on that unexceptional and very brief exchange with her, I believe she knew exactly what this phrase meant. And so I've been trying to play catch-up over the years. That's where I've been. I've been trying to play catch-up. And as I've been doing that, I've come to appreciate the profound beauty and power of John's short comment here. Almost in passing, it's the kind of phrase you might just be guilty of passing over when you read it, not giving it a whole lot of thought, seeing it going, okay, that's interesting. What's next? Ooh, Jesus. All right, here we go. There is profound beauty and power to this statement. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. But what does it mean? What does it mean? What does this phrase mean? Well, let's break it down together. Listen to other instances of that first phrase there in in that statement. In the next chapter, chapter 20, verse 4, John will see those who were beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. These are like the souls under the altar in chapter 6. Do you remember those? How long, O Lord? How long, as we talked about last time, God's ultimate justice. These were beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. Who did the dragon attack in chapter 12? Those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Chapter 12, verse 17. But these conquered the dragon by the word of that testimony, right? That testimony. We also learn at the very beginning of this book in chapter 1, verse 2, take a look, that John bore witness to the word of God. He bore witness to the testimony of Jesus Christ even to all that he saw. Word of God, testimony of Jesus, all that he saw. John was faithful to bear witness. Now, it's not surprising if you look at the next verse there in chapter 1. See that on the screen? There's a familiar word in that very next verse, isn't there? Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. The prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it for the time is near. So there we have the testimony of Jesus. There we have prophecy mentioned. And if we were to jump to the very end of the book, to chapter 22, we would find that four times John talks about this revelation as a prophecy. Chapter 22, verse 7, verse 10, verse 18, verse 19. Three times called the prophecy of this book and one's called the book of this prophecy. So how does this help us understand the statement, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy? Well, think again about the angel's correction in verse 10. He corrects John, doesn't he? He corrects this misdirected worship. How could John, thinks the angel, how could John worship the messenger when the message itself was so clearly and so wonderfully about the Lamb, about his marriage to the glory of God? Therefore, in light of that correction, John spells this out probably for himself and for his readers. He spells out this overarching principle The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That is, 
everything in this book, this book of prophecy, prophecy is meant to bear witness to Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. It drives this, prosop- this prophecy to testify of Christ is the purpose of this book. That, of course, should not be news to us. Why? Because if you read this book from the beginning, you would know the opening words of this book tell us the same thing. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Those are the first words. The revelation of Jesus Christ. It's in two senses here. It was given both through him, the revelation Jesus gave, but it's also about him, as we'll see throughout this book. He revealed it, and it reveals him in an amazingly unique way. How lamentable, how anguish-inspiring it should be for us that so many of our brothers and sisters for so many years, stretching back decades, well into the 1800s, have looked at this book and they have spent more time trying to solve it like a puzzle rather than drop to their knees in adoration of the Jesus who is revealed here. That should break our hearts. That should break our hearts. Brothers and sisters, what does God want you to take from this book? We talked last week about you leaving this book singing in light of how amazing it was in terms of the justice of God, that God is truly going to right every wrong. He's going to address every wrong. He's going to purge this universe. He's going to put down our rebellion. He's going to do that. He's going to reward the faithful, his people who have been oppressed, who have been mistreated. He's going to bring them and exalt them in glory with himself by his grace alone. We should long for that day. Whenever we see someone suffering and hurting, we should long for that day when that suffering and that hurt will be no more. It should drive us to testify of Christ. So if this book leaves us singing in light of the justice of God, it has to leave us also singing more fully about Jesus, the one who bore that justice on the cross for us, and that we can let people know all around us that you either accept that Jesus bore justice for you on the cross in the past, or you face justice from God in the future. We should be inspired that this book is about Christ. It points us to Jesus. What What does God want you to share about this book? What should come to mind when we think about this book called Revelation? God has given us an answer to that this morning through John. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus. When it comes to this book, it's very easy, isn't it, to get lost in the weeds of strange symbols and apocalyptic timelines. It is very easy to seek mastery over these mysteries instead of seeking the master through these mysteries. That's what he wants us to do. That's what John is reminding us of here and himself. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It bears witness to him that we might bear witness to him as well. You see, though we have confirmation from God, these are the true words of God. Like John, we can suffer from confusion about this revelation. The otherworldliness of this book, this revelation, can, can somehow outshine the one revealed. Is that even possible? We act like that sometimes, don't we? The revelation itself outshines the one who is revealed in the book. But as with John, and through John, with John's help, God graciously provides correction for us as well. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Confirmation, confusion, correction from God. But are we listening this morning? John saw, he listened, he received the correction, 
and then he wrote. Are we listening? Will we receive the correction? Will we testify of Jesus as we've seen him testify to in this book? Now, with the time that we have remaining this morning, I thought it would be wonderful to look at four visions of Jesus presented to us in the Revelation. Are there only four visions of Jesus in this book? No. There are brief images of Jesus, different ways, different places. Right? They're presented as well. Images like the child who was born of the woman in chapter 12. In chapter 5, we hear a little bit about the lion of the tribe of Judah. So there are these little kind of snippets, right? Glimpses that we get that show us Christ, that point us to Christ, that reveal Christ. But these four are the dominant visions of the book. And my prayer for all of us is that these visions of Jesus, as he has revealed himself to us through the revelation, just stop and think about that for a minute. How does the New Testament begin and how does the New Testament end? It begins with the revelation of Jesus Christ in the Gospels. It ends with the revelation of Jesus Christ in the Revelation. It begins with Jesus entering our world to build his church. It ends with Jesus promising he'll return to our world to take the church, to bring the church to himself. It begins with the Gospels where Jesus is speaking truth drawing men and women into his church, preparing his church. It ends with Jesus speaking truth to his churches. Guiding them, loving them, shepherding them. You see, we have these bookends to the New Testament that are Jesus' bookends. The ministry of Jesus. And so he has graciously, and we give him thanks for it, he has graciously revealed himself in unique ways here in the Revelation. But as we look at these visions this morning, I pray that it will serve to expand your understanding of Jesus. It will inform your faith. It will deepen your worship. It will strengthen your devotion. It will assuage your fears. It will sober your outlook. It will inspire your choices. It will embolden your witness to Christ. So let's get right to it. The first time, take a look. The first time we see Jesus in chapter 1, he is the Lord among the lampstands. He is the Lord among the lampstands. Starting in verse 9 of chapter 1 and running all the way through the end of chapter 3, we are given the stunning glimpse of Jesus, the glorified Son of God. What is he doing? He's standing in the midst of seven golden lampstands. Now, is this a real scene somewhere in time and space? No, it's a symbolic vision. The chapter tells us that. The lampstands are representations of something else. Else, He has stars in his hands. They are symbols of something else. Even the way Jesus is described here is symbolic. But what is it communicating? Why is he choosing to reveal himself in this way? Look at how he's described, if you're there in chapter 1. White hair, flaming eyes, bronze feet. I've never seen a picture of Jesus like this, right? Like on those little tracks or somebody, you go into somebody's home and they've got a picture of Christ there or whatever it might be or represented in a movie. He's never represented like this. White hair, flaming eyes, bronze feet, a face shining like the sun. Why these? Because they uniquely communicate things like his divine power and purity. His supernatural insight. Later it will be talked about as eyes, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent throughout the world. He knows all. He sees all. His eye is on every one of his children, his brothers and sisters. Supernatural insight. 
And his otherworldly glory just is, comes through loud and clear in this vision. Add to this the way he describes himself. 117 and 18, listen to this. Fear not. That's a good intro based on the white hair and flaming eyes, face shining like the sun. <laughs> Don't tell me Christ isn't compassionate. He knows, he understands. Fear not, John. I know I'm freaking you out right now, but fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Power over death and Hades. Now, this is an exalted vision, isn't it? But as exalted as this vision is, John is not seeing Jesus far above at the right hand of God. Where is he seeing him? Near, standing in the midst of the lampstands, which we know means he's standing in the midst of his church. His churches. Yeah, these churches, there's seven of them here, and they were seven actual churches. Just read chapters two and three. But that number seven was not chosen at random. It is a number of divine perfection or completeness. Therefore, seven it almost seems to communicate that this represents, these seven churches represent any and every church, including this church. And where is Jesus? He is near, here, in our midst, with us. Glorified, but close. Present, powerful, but present with his people. But as chapter two and three reveal to us, I love it. Just listen to this. Here's the Lord among the lampstands. What does chapter 2 and 3 reveal to us? That he is watching us. That he is guiding us. That he is correcting us. When we need it, he is encouraging us. He is calling us forward. He is the good shepherd. He is our risen, living Lord. Man, if I don't get a hallelujah or amen or something, because you all look like the frozen chosen here this morning. Pastor, we're just drinking it in. We're just drinking it in. I hope you are. Just think about this, how beautiful this picture here is here. Does it reassure you? Does it reassure you? Whatever we face as a faith family, the Lord of the Lamb stands is in our midst. He's... He never, amen, he's never negligent, is he? He's never distracted. It should sober us. It should cause us to stop and check our hearts, our hearts toward him, our heart toward the faith family. It should have us check our efforts. Am I giving my very best to what is most important in this world, the work of the kingdom of God, or is it an extracurricular activity for me? Is church and fellowship with my brothers and sisters something I try to squeeze in to my priority-driven life, all of these important things I have to do. The Lord of the lampstands is with us, and he sees each of us. He corrects, he guides, he encourages. But in chapter 5, we also meet the Lamb who alone is worthy. The Lamb who alone is worthy. All creation weeps in chapter 5. When you're reading there, you see it because it seems that no one can open this scroll that God has as he's seated on his throne. It's a scroll that is a plan for ultimate justice to be brought, the correction we need, the healing and restoration we need for this sin-sick universe. And no one, it seems, can open the scroll, which means to carry out God's plan, to implement God's plan. But John beholds in verse 6 of chapter 5, a lamb standing as though it had been slain. With seven horns and with seven eyes. Horns were symbols of authority and power coming all the way from the Old Testament. The eyes, we talked about what that means. How do we know this is Jesus? Well, a few verses later, it's confirmed for us in verse 9 of chapter 5. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. Hallelujah. For you were 
slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Don't you love that? Look around this room. Think about our heritages as a people. All of us, our ancestors are from different places. Tribes and tongues and nations and languages. Oh, wouldn't you long to see this room filled with a beautiful mosaic of the human family from every tribe, language, nation, and people here praising God together reenacting what, it, what, what takes place even now before his throne, as chapter 7 reveals. We want that, don't we? Pray that God would help you to be a test, to, uh, give testimony to Jesus and, and to step outside of your comfort zone maybe and share that with anyone who comes down that path in your life. So before he is the Lord among the lampstands, he is the lamb who alone is worthy. One has to precede the other, for the church only exists because of the cross. That's the only reason that there is a church, because of the cross. We would not be his people if we were not first ransomed by his blood, as this tells us here. It's so important to point out that this vision of Jesus, here in chapter 5, is the vision that dominates the book. So if you, if you remember only one of the four visions today, it's got to be this one. This is it, the Lamb. The Lamb is the hero of this book. He truly is. He is the hero of this story. In one sense, so it's starting in chapter 5, running all the way down through chapter 22, he is mentioned 26 times in this book. The Lamb. So in one sense, we could say this, everything Jesus does in this book he does as the lamb. Everything he does, he does as the lamb. That is, he does as the one who ransomed us with his own blood, our redeemer. So whenever, 26 times throughout this book, whenever you read that word lamb, it's supposed to hit you. Power through weakness. Died for your sins. Gave himself. Victory through defeats. Right? It's all of that supposed to hit you with this word 26 times, chapters 5 through 22. The Lamb, the Lamb, the Lamb. How beautiful is that thought that the one who walks among the lampstands has already proven how much he loves you. And how committed he is to you. You don't have to doubt that. You don't have to be unsure about his purposes in your life and for this faith family. You don't have to be. He's already proven that to you. He's proven to you. He's proven that to an extent that no one else ever has, will, or can Love and commitment. And so no matter what happens, even if the world itself was coming to an end, <laughs> which, it, which it is, <laughs> right? You guys are lost. The book of Revelation. The world. I feel like the world's coming to an end. We say that as an exact, like a hyperbole, right? Exaggeration. No, it's actually coming to an end in this book. Even if the world was coming to an end, we do not have to be afraid. We do not have to be worried. The Lord of the Lamb stands is the Lamb. You can be reassured, believer, because He knows your name. How does He know it? It's written, chapter 21 27. 21 27. It's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what the book's called, the Lamb's Book of Life. He knows you. He cares for you. As we near the end of the book in chapter 19, we behold another vision of Jesus, this time as the king coming to conquer. The king coming to conquer. In chapter 19, verse 11, the imagery is familiar, isn't it? A hero riding in on a white horse to save the day. Is this Jesus? 
You better believe it. It's Jesus. Here he comes, right? On the white horse, breaking in the time and space. Jesus. How do we know it's Jesus? He is faithful and true, it says. We saw that in chapter 3. That's how Jesus t- talked about himself, the faithful and true witness. He is, verse 13 of chapter 19, the word of God. We know that from John chapter 1, don't we? Jesus is the word. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And he has a name. It's written on his robe, 19 tells us. Chapter 19 tells us. It says, King of kings and Lord of lords. Is that the first time we've heard that expression? It's not. And this comes back to our earlier point. The first time we hear that title, it was given in chapter 17, verse 4, where John writes, They will make war on the Lamb. And the Lamb will conquer them, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. You see, Jesus, like I just said, right? Everything Jesus does in this book, he does as the Lamb. Here he is, King of kings and Lord of lords. Why is the vision of the rider on the white horse so important? Because it's meant to reassure us as well. It's meant to reassure us in that big kind of ultimate way. The lamb who was slain, who is now among us as Lord of the lampstands, will one day return to overthrow every rebel power, every destructive reality, every cancerous lie, every person trying to play God as they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Will he do so in a massive Michael Bay-inspired battle scene, pummeling the forces of sinful humanity who have gathered for war? Well, yes, Jesus is going to use a sword, but it's the sword of his mouth. I hate to break this to you, people who love blockbuster movies. This is the sword of his mouth. That is his word. It's his word. He tells one of the churches in chapter 2, I'm going to come and fight against you with the sword of my mouth. Is there going to be some epic battle scene in Pergamum? No. (laughs) It just means he's bringing his word and his decree has power. He speaks and things are changed. He speaks the world is different. He simply speaks and every opposing force in this world is upended and overturned forever. Just that word. That's it. One day. Well, these nations are mobilizing. These things are happening. Tanks. Blah, 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 blah. (laughs) When God sees fit and the son trusting the father's time, the day and the hour, the son will simply speak and everything will be concluded. It will be done. That's it. There's no political intrigue. There's no, oh, wow, wow. I don't know, Bill, what do you think? This is looking pretty crazy out here. The forces of the world are gathered against Jesus. Oh, but here he comes from the clouds on a white horse. He's got, he's got the armies of heaven, the hosts of heaven with him right now. I don't know. This could be close. No, it's not going to be. It's not that at all. Jesus simply speaks because we know that he upholds, he, abstain, he sustains the universe by the word of his power. Hebrews chapter 1. He sustains it by the word of his power. And so when he's done sustaining it, when it's time for it to be completed, the word of his power will speak it, and it will be so. It will be done. That's what we have here. But even before we meet the writer, as we've heard this morning in our main text, we are also introduced to the husband receiving his bride. The husband receiving his bride. The fulfillment of that heavenly announcement that you see there in chapter 19, if you're still there, chapter 19, verses 6 through 8, that heavenly announcement of the Lamb's marriage, that's found, actually the fulfillment is found two chapters later in chapter 21, verse 2, where John witnessed this. I witnessed the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
Well, pastor, that's the, that's the city. That's our future home. That's not the bride. That's not the church. It just says it's kind of like a bride. No, that's the bride. The confirmation is just a few verses later in 21 verse 9 where the angel invites John to get a closer look at the city. He says, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Well, wait a minute. Maybe you go into the New Jerusalem and you find the bride in there somewhere sitting at a big banquet table for this marriage supper. No, brothers and sisters, the city is the, la- is the bride. There's no real cube, golden cube city coming out of the sky. I hate to break it to you again. That's not what this is saying. No golden cube city floating over the earth. No pearly gates, no streets of gold, like the the old song said. That's not, that's a misunderstanding of the symbolic imagery described here. But once you wrap your mind around it, once you grasp that this is a symbolic picture of our forever with Jesus, then it starts to take shape. You see, the splendor of the new Jerusalem represents for us the splendor of a blessed and eternal union with Jesus. How good will it be? You've heard the phrase marital bliss? Oh, you haven't seen anything. That, we're going to blow that phrase up, right? Right? The, the, the fullness of this is going to break the internet, friends, right? The fullness of this kind of marital bliss forever and ever because no other marriages will continue. Jesus told us that. Our, our marriages in this life are for this life. They don't continue into the future. I hate to break it to the, our LDS friends. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen, Right? There's only one marriage that lasts forever. There is only one forever family. It is Jesus Christ and his bride. It is the people of God. That's what we see here. The splendor of the city is the splendor of the blessed and eternal union between Christ and his church. Please let this truth sink deep into your hearts. The love of the lamb who was slain. The love of the Lord who stands even now in our midst. The love of the King who is to come will find its eternal fullness in the love of our heavenly husband. Forever and ever, he will love and cherish his bride. Forever and ever, he will provide and protect his bride. Forever and ever, he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Thus, we read this about the city that is, in fact, a bride. Chapter 22, verses 3 through 5. It says, No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. Brothers and sisters, that is our happy estate with Jesus forever. Think again about this book, this prophecy. Four visions, the testimony of Jesus. Could could John have been unchanged by what he was shown? Think about that. Could John have really been unchanged by what he beheld? No way. No way. But we have to ask, therefore, could you and I be unchanged by what we've been shown in this book? Can we walk away unaffected? We need to ask God that that would never be true. Amen? Let's pray that. In fact, we can think about it this way. Doesn't God's word also confirm for us in many places that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy in regard to everything God has revealed throughout his word? 
not just this book, but the spirit of prophecy that gave rise to all the scriptures. Isn't the testimony of Jesus the spirit of that prophecy, of all that prophecy? It's not just Revelation. It's every book of the Bible. So as you begin reading the Old Testament, let's ask God to continue showing us visions of Jesus even when they're harder to see right away. Amen? Let's pray.